The modern classic or retro motorcycle movement isn't something that's really been discussed a whole lot. I mean, we talk about the riders sometimes, and up until relatively recently, it was kind of all about hipsters. People like to talk about it sort of being a hipster thing to ride a retro bike. But as this is one of the most popular kinds of motorcycle that you can buy, I think it's really helpful to get an understanding of the bikes themselves that have influenced all of this and sort of separate all of this also from the original bikes. Many times we lump, you know, the new Bonnevilles in with the old, when really these new retro motorcycles have almost nothing in common with those original bikes, and they are born out of completely different times and places and desires. There are two eras for these bikes. You have the originals, and then you have the new ones that point back. But for me, modern classics and retros have their own interesting and sometimes surprising history. Now, I'm not going to cover every single retro motorcycle ever made, and my goal with this video isn't so much to detail every single aspect of these motorcycles, but rather sort of take a step back and look at this movement and this craze as a whole and how it unfolded with different important motorcycles along the way. So let's go back and start where I think much of this started with the very first retro motorcycles. Now I want to start by looking at what I would call pre-retro retros. These are motorcycles that sort of predate the whole retro modern classic craze that started in really the early and mid 2000s. But these are bikes that fit the same mold and some of them are influential in this movement. Many of these motorcycles are actually classics in their own right, not just modern classics, as they're now over 30 years old and some of them are pretty rare. Now, as is true with many of these early retros, the Harley Davidson XLCR, with CR standing for Cafe Racer, well, it really wasn't a big hit. This bike is so ahead of its time that it's hard to even really call it retro. This came out all the way back in 1977, and by this time the actual cafe racer scene was you know, completely dead, but it was sort of being revitalized with Japanese bikes here in the United States. So in many ways, Harley was actually jumping on what was sort of a current trend. But looking back at this bike, it feels like a retro motorcycle. And if Harley came out with this bike today, we would say that, you know, Harley's trying to make a retro bike. I've talked about this motorcycle at length in my video on not so Harley Harleys. It's so interesting, it's hard to really define it as either a classic or a modern classic in its own right, but it is in some way pointing back to the British bikes from, you know, a few decades prior to its own release. And in that sense, it really was a retro motorcycle. Now, as we move into the 80s, there are very few retro motorcycles. It wasn't really in fashion in the 80s to make motorcycles look older than they were, as the advancements in technology were key to most companies' strategies at this point. It was all about pushing the envelope and moving forward, not really looking back. Now, one could point to bikes like the Yamaha SR400 and SR500 and, you know, even the Royal Enfield Bullet, bikes that just never changed. Changed. They sort of seamlessly transitioned from classic to retro while the world around them changed, so that by the 90s, these motorcycles were thoroughly old school with only the necessary advancements happening, and they did maintain sort of a classic style. Now, one thoroughly odd and maybe misguided attempt at a retro motorcycle came about in the early 90s. This is one of the first real retro motorcycles that I can think of, the Suzuki SW01. I don't want to spend very much time on this bike, just to say that it is a great example example of what we see in the early and mid 90s. There were a few attempts at retro bikes that really don't capture the public at this time because, well, they're not Bonnevilles. <laughs> You'll see what I mean shortly. But the SW01 was a retro motorcycle more in the style of early British roadsters. Think, you know, 50s and not so much 60s. And specifically bikes that had these weird bathtub fairings, like a T110 from the 50s or even, you know, the Vincent Black Prince. This bike was not going to change the world. Uh, this style wouldn't be the specific type of old school motorcycle that people would end up liking. And then in the 1990s, we see another important but not exactly game-changing retro motorcycle, the Honda GB400 and GB500. These bikes have actually become highly collectible, not very many of them were made, and here we see a motorcycle much closer to the kind of retro bike that would ultimately end up taking off. The GB range were big single cylinders, not really performance bikes at all, but they were somewhat in the spirit of the original bikes that they were copying, which again, weren't the iconic British twins, but rather the iconic British sporting singles of the 50s. Think famous ton-up bikes like the BSA Gold Star or, you know, the Veliset Thruxton. 
Again, for whatever reason, this style of motorcycle would not be the kind that takes off. I think it's probably worth noting also, these are not motorcycles that can point to their own company's history. And authenticity will become a massive part of the retro motorcycle movement, especially in how they advertise their bikes. So having Japanese companies like Suzuki and Honda make these weirdly British looking bikes, it just didn't work. Now you might think that as we head into the late 90s, the Triumph Bonneville has to be the next bike that we talk about, but actually it's another Japanese company that in my opinion made the first modern classic as we would know them to be. Alright, here it is. And you might look at this bike and think, wow, that's a nice Bonneville. But this isn't a Bonneville. This is the Kawasaki W650, and it actually predates the return of the Bonneville from Triumph by about a year. Now, I don't personally believe that the Bonneville copied the W650. I think I've said something like that at some point in the past on this channel, and I don't think that's true. These models were definitely developed, you know, in tandem, and you can see why they both would become lasting staples in this class. They're developed to look like the right kind of old British bike that people would like, and that's, you know, the big twins of the 60s. Now, what I will say, and of course, this is also speculation, but I think there's good reason to believe it. I think that the W650 and the Bonneville both were made to look like one motorcycle, and that's the original Bonneville, particularly the Bonnevilles of the 60s. The BSA or Triumph cradle frame, Bonneville still in the head is what it looks like. I mean, are you asking me if I had any input into this? I mean, we're <laughs> yes. both as old as each other, for God's sake. And there's a lot of inspiration from a lot of truly British motorcycles in this particular product. The W in W650 harkens back to Kawasaki's W1. Essentially, Kawasaki partnered with BSA say in the 60s to make a Japanese big British twin. That's right, a Japanese British bike. And that was the W1, and that bike was an iconic bike in and of itself. But when you look at both BSA's big twins and the W1, then look at the W650, I mean the engine is beautifully styled after the W1 and sometimes the paint scheme looks similar, but besides that, this bike looks much more like, you know, a 66 Bonneville or something like that. Now over time the W650 would evolve into the W800 and Kawasaki still sells this despite it never really taking off here in the States and they sell other W models. I believe most of their W800 sales come from Europe and Japan, but overall this model really has changed very little since its inception. It would never become a massive success, but I think it is important as a bike, as it really was the first motorcycle released, to really nail this retro styling that we still all love. And in many ways the W line, especially today, is more representative representative of the old British twins than anything else that you can get. Now that brings us to the heart of this whole discussion, which is the Triumph Bonneville. Now the reintroduction of the Bonneville by Triumph and its slow growth in popularity and the expansion of the model lineup, this coincided with a particular change in thinking, especially in the West, and in just a cultural shift. Throughout this time, you know, post 9-11 with the ongoing war and then the economic collapse of 08, Western culture becomes more insulated and more nostalgic. And that's common during, you know, similar situations throughout history. There are times when culture looks forward and there are times when culture seems to be looking back. You know, I can't sit here and act like my deep love for things from the 60s, whether it's cars or motorcycles. I can't sit here and pretend that I'm not a product of my own culture and you know, <laughs> I'm looking back the same way everybody else is looking back. But if you look at, you know, a chromey Bonneville and you find it appealing, there's a good chance that you're a product of this as well. Or, you know, you remember when motorcycles were actually like that and it just has kind of always appealed to you. But retro today is everything, whether it's fashion made to look, you know, 90s or music from, you know, the 70s or TV shows like Stranger Things with their sort of hardcore 80s vibes. We are currently a culture that is obsessed with looking back. And that's what we have with the reintroduction of the Bonneville and with this growth in retro bikes, but specifically Triumph's lineup. Triumph did something fascinating and it's where they were really able to stand out. See, they had the heritage this was the revival of a great British company. People were excited about Triumph coming back anyways, and focusing in on arguably the greatest British motorcycle, or at least the most iconic British motorcycle of all time, that is the Bonneville, and making it accessible and usable for the first time. You know, the thought that you could jump on 
a Bonneville and drive it across the United States was just so cool. And it really wasn't until this point that you could do that. And ultimately, you know, these early Bonnevilles would really prove themselves to be just as reliable or, you know, close to as reliable as a Japanese bike. But now you're riding a bike that actually looks classic. As much as we can point to Western nostalgia and even the hipster movement as a reason for the Bonneville's success, the reality is that the Bonneville built this retro craze just as much as the retro craze built it. You know, there is no Interceptor, for example, without the Bonneville. This bike is sort of the foundation of everything. Now, over the years, Triumph would update and expand this model lineup. You know, it started out as a 790cc air-cooled twin, but Triumph would release, you know, up spec bigger versions, and often those bigger, faster versions would become the standard. Ultimately, this lineup would become liquid-cooled and end up a rather tech-heavy bike, honestly. I've talked about this before, but... The base versions of these big twins, including the T120, that is the 1200cc versions, these weren't ever really performance machines, and over time, they became almost cruisers in terms of character. They're super torquey, but they are quite heavy, especially in comparison to the originals, and those high-revving fast bikes of the 60s, you know, that could easily be turned into off-road machines, for example, they were almost like really fast dirt bikes, and that could not be further from what the Bonneville has become. At almost every point, though, Triumph really proved that they understood what it was that people liked about the styling of these old British bikes. I've critiqued the modern Bonnevilles quite a bit for being thick and clumpy and, and in many ways not in the original spirit of the great triumphs of the 60s, but in the end, they really are great motorcycles, they're highly customizable, and they're fun to ride, and they look great. Now, I say that the base versions of the Bonneville, even as they grow in size, well, they weren't really performance bikes in any regard. The increases in CCs wouldn't really make major increases in power. I mean, you can buy a Bonneville from 2002 or 2004, and it's pretty much just as fast, if not faster, than all the 900cc options now. But that was never really the goal. In the end, as they increased size, they really were just tuning them to bring up that low-end grunt. And it's not that Triumph couldn't make awesome power out of their twins. And that brings us to the Thruxton and the Speed Twin. Now, these motorcycles are, in my opinion, the closest thing that you can get in terms of the original intent with the Triumphs of the 60s. Those were the fastest motorcycles in the world. And in many ways, they were also the lightest in the world. And sure, the Thruxton and Speed Twin aren't the fastest motorcycles in the world, but with, you know, 100 plus horsepower, they really are competitive with the bikes in their class, and they maintain that classic styling, and Triumph managed to make major weight cuts to these bikes versus the other ones. And they're also not neo-retro, you know, they're not plastic sport bikes that just have a round headlight thrown on, they're actually still retro, and they still use chrome and metals so they're fast they're powerful they sound great they just have everything and that's why a lot of people love them for me if i were to get a sport bike i would consider getting a speed twin or a thruxton because you could take these bikes to the track even if you wanted and at least have some fun but they're fantastic for the twisties and you're not going to find yourself you know wanting more power the way that you could with a t100 or even a t120 now besides triumph other companies have turned their performance platforms into retros and Neo Retros, and with the Z900 RS, that kind of stands out as the absolute best version of this. With the Z900 RS and other bikes, companies have learned that there are loads of different kinds of classic, iconic motorcycles from their own history that they can sort of model modern bikes after and, you know, ultimately get sales if they do it well. The Z900 obviously looks back at the big inline 4Z1, but with other color schemes at times, it also looks like the Eddie Lawson Kawasaki replicas. On the far end of the spectrum, one could look at bikes like the MV Agusta Super Veloce and even the Speed Triple RR. These are full-blown sport bikes with just a touch of that 60s race bike influence. One of the more interesting attempts at a retro bike was the Ducati Sport Classic line, and these really are the first performance-oriented retros, and they've kind of paved the way for bikes like the Super Veloce. Sometimes motorcycles are too ahead of their time, though, and on some level that was certainly true with the Sport Classic lineup. In their day, these bikes just sat on Ducati dealership floors. Nobody really wanted them, but, you know, this is all the way back in 2005, so nothing like this kind of bike had ever existed. These motorcycles are important, again, because they mark a new kind of retro motorcycle, not one that looks back at, you know, British 
twins, but rather, you know, one that looks back at sort of old, maybe Italian race bikes. Without the Sport Classic line, we wouldn't have, again, bikes like the Super Veloce or the Speed Triple RR with their retro half fairings. Ducati did it first, all the way back in 05 with the Sport Classics. And even before the Sport Classic, we have the MH900E, which is its own story in and of itself. Now, amidst all of this, and on the absolute other end of the spectrum, we have Royal Enfield basically just making old motorcycles forever. Royal Enfield's part in this whole retro motorcycle craze is really important. In many ways, at this point, they're kind of the ones keeping it alive. One has to wonder if, you know, we'll even be talking about retro motorcycles 30 years from now. But with Royal Enfield, we have always had affordable, classically styled minimalist bikes. But again, they weren't really retro for the longest time. They were just old motorcycles, you know, with the necessary updates to either make them available in terms of regulations or just because (laughs) they had to. But with the Interceptor, Royal Enfield had finally made a compelling, affordable, fun, classically styled British bike that moved away from the tech focus of Triumph's modern classics. A bike like this doesn't have to have ride-by-wire or rider modes. It's just a simple air-cooled 650. It's not fast. It's heavy for what it is. You know, it's not going to hang with most modern motorcycles, but it's cool. And that's really the key factor. Cool and affordable. That's what riders want. And that's what has made the Interceptor one of the best-selling motorcycles in the entire world. Also, in terms of affordable retros, there has been another kind of motorcycle. Basically, various companies have figured out that they can take a simple, reliable, usually small single-cylinder engine sourced from, say, Suzuki or Honda or maybe a Chinese manufacturer, and they can build around it a cool, custom, retro, classically-styled bike that's affordable and just really fun. Think companies like Mutt or Janus and loads of others. You know, there's companies that are reviving iconic names that are using this model as well. Many of these companies understand what riders want. A company like Mutt, for example, they understand the kind of motorcycle that people want. And they're bikes that look cool, that could pass as, you know, custom sort of trackers and scramblers pretty easily. Mutt appears to be taking the next step to even develop their own liquid-cooled engines. This model of using, you know, reliable single-cylinder engines and just sort of attaching it to their own bikes, this has really worked well for them. They've obviously brought in some money to be able to be developing their own motorcycles in a more I don't know, in-depth way. But again, with the Interceptor, I feel like some of these companies have probably taken a hit because why would you buy a bike like this when you could get an Interceptor, which is bigger and better and you know, about the same price and has a warranty and it's from a reputable manufacturer, seems like the Interceptor just has more potential to be less of a headache than these sort of, I don't know, custom-made bikes. Now, if you've been around my channel for a while, you know that I used to make videos about retro electric motorcycles. At that time, I was kind of fascinated with finding new different companies who were taking a stab at a classically designed electric bike, as it does come with some challenges, like... Why does that bike have a gas tank? (laughs) At this point, I don't believe any major manufacturer has made a retro electric bike, and most of these random companies aren't really noteworthy, honestly. But Royal Enfield did just recently buy a large share of an electric dirt bike company, so one has to wonder if they aren't investing in the future and maybe trying to build... I don't know, an electric interceptor. That could be down the road. While we've covered the great modern classics of the past 20 years or so, there have been quite a few duds, bikes that were essentially lazy attempts at cashing in on this retro craze. Yamaha had one of those at one point. And it's also hard not to put the gold star in this camp as well, as it just seems like such an uninspiring, uninteresting attempt. I've made an entire video about this, as it is the most recent big retro bike to come out. I guess I have to mention it, but yeah, not uh, not super excited about this bike. But there are others. I think my main goal with this video was to highlight the bikes themselves. I think many times when people have talked about the retro motorcycle movement, they like to attribute it solely to various movements and style, and the motorcycles are more of a response to this demand. And certainly some motorcycles fall into that category. But for me, it's the motorcycles themselves that have created the movement just as much or more. You know, it's companies like Triumph and Kawasaki who, for some reason, were committed to making modern classic bikes well before it was cool. These companies kept making spectacular modern classic bikes, but especially Triumph. I mean, as much as I've picked on Triumph, they have absolutely committed 
to this. They knew that it would work. Before people were really that interested, they knew expanding the Bonneville lineup would build them up as a company, and it's become such a massive part of their identity. But we all have Triumph to thank <laughs> for this, whether you like retro bikes or not. But yeah, Triumph, man, gotta gotta give Triumph their props at this point. Now, I've critiqued this kind of motorcycle, and specifically retro motorcycles, quite a bit on this channel, as I've always found it more interesting to just have the original thing. Like, I don't really want to have a record player that is made to look like a specific old record player. I just kind of want to have the old record player. I don't know, that's just how my mind works. I don't really want a new Camaro that's kind of made to look like an old Camaro or a new VW Bug that's made to look like an old one. I would just personally rather have the old one. Oh, don't get me started about Broncos too. Definitely want the old Bronco. But in the end, I think it's fair to say that, yeah, retro motorcycles are cool. 